The Millennium, a prophetic forecast by Johanna Brandt. Chapter 7, The Third Period, Spiritual, Monasticism. The Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Worldly prosperity in spiritual matters has its dangers and disadvantages. While Constantine the Great lived, there was no fear of degeneration in the Roman Empire, but his successors were not all imbued with his altruism. They had not embraced the Christian faith from purely disinterested motives. Neither had they the living, vital knowledge of its truth which is born of the conviction of personal experience. The Edict of Toleration, which Constantine had enforced with scrupulous severity, was no longer respected to the same degree, and it became custom to punish the heathens who failed to adopt the Christian faith. The result was that large numbers became Christians through fear. Here again, the saving power of pure conviction was lacking, of which the unavoidable result was an inpouring of highly undesirable influences. And the converted heathens introduced into the church their inborn love of worldly pomp and hollow ceremony, their influence of age-long tyranny, oppression, superstition, and perverted morality soon became itself felt in the rising church of the state. The Christians themselves suffered severely in the unnatural forced transition from poverty and persecution to dazzling splendor and restful security. Moral lassitude, spiritual innovation crept over them as an entirely natural reaction from the strife and strain. The moral stamina was gone. There was no longer such urgent need of it. And outward show brought inward pride. All sorts of strange and idolatrous forms of worship were introduced into the church, and the gorgeous pomp of external demonstration had to take the place of the departed spiritual glory. It was a time of extreme peril to the life of faith. The spiritual enemy, unable to accomplish his work of destruction from without, openly and by means of violence, had changed his tactics, crept into his adversary's camp, and strove to overthrow him by means of treachery. That these dangers were fully realized by the men whom we know as the Church Fathers of this period, is proved by the story of their lives and superhuman efforts to preserve and uphold the simple truths of the Christian faith. We can do no more here than mention the names of a few of their number. Chrysostomus, Athanasius, Ambrosius and Aurelius, Augustinus, the greatest church father of the West, whose colossal figure rises head and shoulders above those of his brethren, in the conflict against spiritual degeneration. But even the influence of these men was powerless to stem the tide of materialism, which threatened to overwhelm the church. And finding their efforts checked on every side, Many of the most earnest Christians withdrew themselves entirely from the church. To live a life of devotion and self-denial in rigid seclusion. This was the foundation of that form of asceticism known as monasticism, which flourished during the next six or eight hundred years, and to which the church undoubtedly owes the preservation of her faith and traditions. As early as the first century, 
hermits had existed in desert caves in Palestine. Men who endeavoured to destroy their carnal appetites in a life of exaggerated hardships for developing the powers of the spirit. Their numbers were largely increased when the persecutions broke out by Christians who fled for their lives and hid themselves in caves and forests, in ruined temples and sepulchres. But the movement, which was born when men and women of rank and education forsook the church and renounced the world because they were steeped in material luxury, was of a very different character. In many cases, they were people of great wealth and influence, and they were able to erect suitable buildings in which to establish themselves without fear of persecution. Monasteries arose in every part of the land, at first for men only, but later on, it was found necessary to erect convents to receive the women who longed to escape their worldly environment. Within the walls of these institutions, a life of extreme asceticism was led, men separating themselves from their fellow creatures to such an extent that they sometimes lived for years without seeing any human beings, except the inmates of their monasteries. So we read of a man named Macarius in Lower Egypt who lived in his cell for 23 years to atone for a murder committed by him. An unearthly silence reigned in these tombs of living men, broken only by the clang of the vesper bell and the muffled fall of sandaled feet. In most of these monasteries, silence was imposed at all times, except during the religious services, in the singing of palms and hymns, and many men forgot the sound of their own voices. They partook of their frugal meals in perfect silence, waited on by one of their own brothers who took turns in performing the domestic duties of the monasteries. In the early days of the monasteries, the life of retirement was devoted entirely to worship, contemplation of the divine, studying the scriptures and religious works of literature, and to the purification of self by a rigorous discipline of which it is difficult to form any concept in our day of luxurious abandonment. It was a life of self-development, self-denial, self-suppression, self-purification, self-chastisement, self-analysis, self-knowledge, self-saying. The world forgetting by the world forgot. These men attained to miraculous heights of godliness, of which there is a wealth of evidence in the self-revealing chronicles, which have been left to us by a priceless legacy of their self-renunciation. The air they breathed was steeped in mysticism, while outside, the church of the state pursued its course of world-mindedness and prospered on the material plane, accumulating undreamed of earthly riches. In time, it was found necessary to counterbalance this one-sided development by the introduction of various forms of manual labor, home industries and agriculture, the fruit of which was used in the alleviating of the sufferings of the poor. This was a great step in the right direction. The wise disposal of these products demanded investigation, and investigation 
brought the monks into unavoidable contact with their suffering fellow creatures. This gave rise to a systematic division of the cities into wards or sections to be visited, in turn, by the different brothers. A new world of labour opened up to them, and in many monasteries there were nursing staffs established, of men who went out into the homes of the poor to nurse the sick. In this ever-widening sphere of activity, their spiritual gifts manifested themselves in miracles of healing and prophecy. So much so that the fame of these godly men began to spread throughout the length and breadth of the world. It became impossible to maintain the rigid seclusion of the monasteries, to turn a deaf ear to the voices pleading for admission, for refuge from the storm of life, and gradually these forbidding doors were of necessity opened more and more at the cry of the broken and despairing. Vast additions had to be made to the monasteries to receive the fugitives, and they became imposing structures, which were regarded by the populace with awe and veneration. In the beginning of the 6th century, the great reformer of monasticism, Benedict Nursia, introduced and established a model system of worship for monastic life, which he divided into seven canonical hours, according to Psalm 119, verse 164. Seven times a day do I praise thee. And Psalm 119, verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee, because of thy righteous judgments. This system divided the hours of worship in the following way. Malolina began at 2 o'clock a.m. and was continued by Prima at 6 o'clock, Tertia at 9, Sexta at 12, Non at 3, Vesper at 6, and Completorium at 9 p.m. The rest of the time was spent in private study and meditation, two hours, and in labour at home or in the fields, or among the poor, for seven hours, leaving a margin of eight hours for rest and sleep. This model system spread from the monastery on a mountain near Naples, where Benedict Nursia first introduced it, to all other cloisters in the West, and was the only system in vogue during the following 500 years. He abolished the rigorous fast and exaggerated self-scourings, replacing these by a moderate vegetable diet, in which fish and eggs, and even a little wine, were allowed. And by hours of fixed employment, which left no time for self-imposed flagellations. The monk's hood covered the head, and the long, black flowing garment was loosely held together by a cord, while the higher form of asceticism ever remains a Christian duty. The most superficial glance at the mode of living adopted in the monasteries cannot fail to impress us with its incompleteness. Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Was truly said by the great Augustine, but he demonstrated this by a life of practical service in the world of men, and not by withdrawing into that rest in selfish oblivion of the distress around him. With unerring judgment, he grasped the fact that the loss of the true spiritual element 
at a time of moral innervation, constituted a far greater danger to the church than the worldly temptations which surrounded it. So he remained at home and practiced self-restraint while fulfilling his obligations to church and state. In him, the union of mind and soul, combined with strenuous activity in every department of life, reached a state of perfection, which might well have been taken as an example for all. But the number of Christian men who followed his example at that time was not sufficiently large to check the exodus of deserters. And while the monasteries were full to overflowing with the highest religious devotees, the reins of government in the church fell into the hands of men who now could steer as they chose, unhampered by the opposing element. Open conflict with the church was always avoided. The monasteries stood as silent living protests against the materialism into which the church was gradually sinking, forming a sharp contrast to the surrounding luxury, while the rigid moral austerity of the cloister life acted as a leavening power on the prevailing immorality. But in the meantime, many unselfish lives missed the aim and purpose of their existence. Sanctification of the personality, which is the supreme object of the highest form of asceticism, cannot be attained by the suppression of the natural emotions or by the deadening of man's finer susceptibilities. And monasticism, therefore, is a less exalted form of religion than others, in which the temptations of life are bravely faced and overcome. The trials of our fellow creatures are shared and lightened by sympathetic and helpful service, and the strife and din of the world are conquered by bringing the internal peace to bear upon them. Moreover, the violent suppression of human passions can become dangerous. It drove many monks to insanity and suicide, while others became pitiable moral and physical wrecks. In fact, it is impossible to study this aspect of religious life without coming to the conclusion that the development of the mystic and psychic powers, instead of blunting the emotions, only tends to make them more acutely sensitive. But the forces gathered in hours of intense spiritual communion should find a natural outlet in those human deeds of love and helpfulness that mark the life of the true disciple, of him who enjoyed his followers to labor in the vineyard of humanity, who himself dignified labor by working at the carpenter's bench. True service, indeed, transfigured by love and informed by knowledge, must be rendered in the world. Through the disciple, be not of the world. It is harmony of knowledge, love and service directed to the uplifting of man.